Okay, here it is. Yeah, my presentation is about uh, hyperspectral remote sensing. And um, so let's get a brief introduction. What does it mean? Here we start with a typical um, multi-spectral um, raster image from one of the Sentinel satel satellites. And um, if you open it in your QGS, then you will see, okay, um, we have um, a typical Sentinel-2 scene, uh, which um, covers an area of 100 by 100 kilometers. And if we use this cursor identify tool of QGS, then we see, okay, for each pixel, we get um, up to 12 raster Value, uh, raster band values. So this is typical for multispectral images. They have usually not more than 20 band values. That's a number of band values we can easily handle. Um, compared to that, we see now an MMAP image. MMAP is a German hyperspectral satellite. Uh, obviously, these uh, images are um, um, provided with a less spatial extent. In that case, it's um, the squares of um, 30 by 30 kilometers. But if you look um, into the number of bands, we see there are more than 200, uh, exactly 240 in that case, and um, which um, allows us to to um, observe the, the distribution of um, the electromagnetic uh, spec profile um, much more in detail. And this is exactly what we like to see, having um, a fine, a good um, um, spectral resolution over a um, typical range of from uh, 400 or 500 to 2,500 nanometers, because this um, detailed spectral resolution allows us to um, differentiate between um, different surfaces. For example, it allows us to differentiate between uh, different types of clay and organic matter and soils, um, between uh, different minerals, uh, um, between uh, different types and states of vegetation. Uh, here you see um, specific spectral ranges which have certain features where vegetation can differ and having such an instrument like a hyperspectral sensor um, allows us to yeah, go into the details and uh, differentiate um, biophysical variables. Um, uh, and this can be used in various kinds of applications, for example, in, um, and it's good that you are my chair because this is an, an example from, from a water-related application of hyperspectral um, MAP data, uh, where they used MAP data to map chlorophyll contents in the Lake Constance, one of the largest lakes in Germany. And um, yes. Uh, here is a brief overview of, over um, some hyperspectral satellite missions. What you can see, they all um, have mapped the range between 400 and 2,500 nanometers, not all, but most of them, um, usually more than 100 bands. Um, many of them have a spatial resolution, a pixel resolution, ground sampling distance of 30 meters, and um, yeah, a similar swath, so 30, 30 meters that are covered by one um, orbit. And... Um, uh, but there are also, um, yeah, these are, these are the, uh, until this row, these are the um, sensors we have now. Um, a few days ago, they, um, the plan, um, a commercial co a company, Planet, launched Tanager. Um, obviously, the only satellite mission that does not use an acronym. Tanager means um, a, a family of birds that is known for their colorful um uh, yeah, that they, are, that, that they are very colorful, which fits perfectly to um, the idea of um, mapping more than 420 colors by a satellite. And um, what you see here as well, that uh, in the future, there, there are plans to provide um, also hyperspectral observations that cover much more on Earth. For example, the, the ESA CHIME mission, um, which um, are, will provide um, a coverage of um, satellite images that cover more than 180 kilometers in, in a visual swap. Um, okay. So hyperspectral data can be um, uh, expected. More hyperspectral data will be there in future. And um, we like to use it as well, um, and in particular in QGS. But um, if we do so, we easily run into problems because we are confronted with a large number of um, raster bands. And um, usually it's not easy in standard QGS to relate each single band to a specific spectral region, um, hyperspectral region. Remote sensing is um, focused on on yeah wavelengths, 
wavelengths, uh, wave ranges, and so on. And um, with standard tools in QGIS, it's not easy to um, bring our knowledge on wavelengths and what happens there uh, together with the data that we op can open there. And um, so basic, this is the situation we are confronted with. Um, we have hyperspectral data, but it's hard to use it in standard QGS. So um, that's why we started to develop the, the AMAP box. And since 2016, we do it as a QGS plugin. And the idea is to um, use QGS, which brings you amazing functionality to uh, include information from different sources and interpret your data and uh, you use it together with the ML box maybe on a, on a second screen to um, go into the details of the hyperspectral data set that you have and um, our aims are to ease the visualization and the exploration of such kind of hyperspectral data to ease the processing and give access to state-of-the-art methods from, from science and uh, so we uh, like to address scientists, but also students, companies, authorities, and so uh, um, many, many different users. Um, yeah, here you see um, the, the graphic user interface of the MBOP box. Um, in the in animation, so we have to, we can organize multiple maps side by side to sh visual visualize um, different uh, raster data sets. Uh, left we have MAP image, right we have a planet scope image with eight bands. And what you see here is a raster layer styling panel, which provides uh, multiple shortcuts to um, select the bands that are um, um, ex uh, have recorded data in a certain wavelength region. And also to um, select um, common band combinations to visualize this hyperspectral data. And what you can do so as well as um, to link these um, spectral visualizations between the MAP and um, planet scope data to always show a similar band combination in terms of uh, shown wavelengths regions. So the MAP box in the background um, always has in mind which Rasa band um, is related to which wavelengths and um, can uses this information to sh to um, visualize the data also in a, in a spectral domain. Like here, we have a, a profile plot that shows us the spectral profiles for the selected pixel positions, and um, allows us to plot both profiles of the 240 band MF data and the 8 band planet scope data um, uh, to plot them these profiles against the wavelengths and not against the band number, but the wavelengths in terms of um, nanometers, so a physical unit. Um, of course, you can use the MAP box to calculate um, spectral indices like the normalized difference vegetation index, and a very common um, index in vegetation analysis. So we just calculate, you select the, uh, a band from the near infrared and a, a band from, from, the, from the red light and um, calculate, make this calculation. And what we get is um, a single band image like this one where um, high NDVI values are usually correlated with vegetation and low NDVI values correlated to um, yeah, places where we do not have vegetation. And of course, you can do this with, with the ML box as well, um, but um, to make things easier, we also support a couple of or more than 100 of other um, um, spectral indices that have been described by this awesome spectral indice project. There's also a publication related to, and um, in the ML box, you can um, yeah, start this spectral index creator, uh, select your index. In the, in the tooltip, you will see how this um, index is um, generated. And um, yeah, you collect the number of spectral indices that you might need for your uh, project. Can be from, from different domains. And yeah, this tool can in general be used with any um, raster data set that you have. Um, in case we have the metadata for, in case we know which raster band is related to which uh, wavelengths, um, we have this automatic mapping of um, automatic selection of the raster band to a certain um, band position. 
but it can be done out um, manually as well. Um, as you might have seen here, I changed the sensor. I changed from MMAP to a, to a, to a Sentinel image, and um, the the um, the mapping of um, the um, the identifier, so the spectral region identifier to the band position has changed automatically. Uh, the the ML box supports different types of image classification, um, different methods provided by the scikit learn package in, 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 in Python, logistic regression, um, random force classifier, and so on. And um, yeah, you might use them and also use um, this um, classification statistics tool of um, the ML box that allows you to um, investigate your classification results more in detail and uh, see some aggregated statistics aggregated over the current. Uh, map canvas. Um, but um, yeah, I, I mentioned in in uh, hyperspectral remote sensing, we are interested really what what happens in 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 each of these uh, spectral regions um, that we are. Um, have information for, and if we uh, take one single ML pixel like this rectangle here, so and compare it um, with a um, with a um, and like the, with an image that has a better spatial resolution, like this um, auto picture here, this auto photo, and back home, then we see uh, it's not really easy to say this ML pixel relates to. Um, a certain land cover class. For example, we obviously uh, we have different land cover classes represented in one ML pixel. Uh, for example, we have impervious surfaces, we have uh, some vegetation here, and we have some water. And so that this this ML um, profile is obvi obviously kind of a mixture between um, these other profiles. And um, so the idea is now to to use our hyperspectral information to to um, to 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 look okay how how many to which degree are these other um, surfaces represented in our red profile here and this uh, process is called um, spectral unmixing. Um, there's a a large corpus on literature on, on different approaches, and, and one is also now supported in the ML box. Uh, we have um, this unmixing um, tool and this unmixing workflow where you um, um, select some, some, provide some training data, and then you can uh, use it um, together with an, with an hyperspectral image to create, um, to unmix land cover fractions, for example. Um, here we see on the right side, there's a result of such an unmixing. Uh, we have four bands. Um, each band stands for a certain land cover fraction, and um, uh, there we get the value for, and for each single pixel, they sum up to a value of one or 100%. So what we see here is now for each pixel, the fraction of um, these four land covers, um, how, how it is represented inside um, a single MAP pixel. Here is the MAP spectral resolution. And uh, what you see here is um, um, a tool that supports the visualization of these unmixing results or in generally um, multi-band um, uh, yeah, images that have multiple bands and with float values, uh, where you can um, select or unselect um, specific fraction layers to um, highlight their distribution. Um, the Emerald Box also provides more than um, adds more than 150 algorithms to the QGIS processing toolbox. And um, as yeah, you see here, so there are quite a lot related to classification, to regression tasks, and so on. And um, uh, you can use them also in this um, graphical uh, model designer, which was presented in, in the uh, intro section very well by Kurt Menke. And um, yeah, for example, here is a, is a small model that um, takes a hyperspectral image and uh, resembles it to the to the wavelengths configuration of MMAP and uh, to the uh, to the wavelengths configuration of, of an uh, Sentinel-2 image. Five minutes left. I have to hurry now. And uh, also, we we contribute some some uh, functions to the QGIS expression function functions, which you can use, for example, to calculate values for for um, for vector layer um, attribute tables. 
Um, but not only there, um, there might be different applications where you can use these expressions. For example, this is an, an, a function that um, returns a raster profile for a certain pixel location. And um, not only the profile in the raster values, but also the, the wavelength information and uh, the wavelength unit, like uh, nanometers or so. And this can be used, um, for example, like here in other parts of QGS, for example, as map tip. Um, where um, each place where I place my, my cursor um, will pop up um, such a map tip with some, some information on the layer, but also this um, interactive plot that plots the raster values against the wavelengths and not against the band numbers only. And um, how is this um, realized? Here we have the raster layer properties, the display section. Here is um, the HTML code that shows some information. And inside this HTML code, we define some JavaScript code that uses the Plotly to um, create this interactive plot, and here inside we have this um, QGS expression function that uh, pro that um, takes out the raster profile information. Uh, the ML box includes a couple of other applications, though often domain specific applications, and most of them um, are described in their own publication, just to get, get in a small overview. And uh, we um, have created um, an, a publication that is now in press and will be able um, as um, open publication uh, about the MAP box, uh, about the MAP mission, and, and also all these um, different applications related to. Um, what can be expected in the next Amberbox version? We try to release it uh, uh, in October, so this month. Uh, we hope that it runs well on the on the uh, all versions between the uh, stay and the, the long term release and the latest release. Uh, we did a lot to improve our documentation and also provide two new tools. For example, the Spec Deep Map applications um, developed by Leon Friedrich from the University of Helsinki. Um, it's um, related to semantic segmentation. Oh, it's a mistake here. Um, so using the PyTorch um, framework um, to, yeah, basically to prepare data that it can be used to train a deep learning model and afterwards to um, apply this deep learning model um, on, on hyperspectral or any, any spectral data. And um, there's a tool that um, helps you to compare um, uh, land cover maps um, from, for example, for, to, yeah, to, to, to visualize how land cover might have changed uh, related to the currently shown map canvas extent um, using these Sankey plots. And uh, in this case, we, we see two maps, but um, um, the, the tool will be able to visualize as many maps as you, as you, as you um, um, provide for it. For example, to, to see land cover changes over time. Uh, we look into how we can use all these processing algorithms uh, efficiently in, in high, high performance computing environments using Slurm workload manager. For example, um, we will look, um, we hope that we get some, some, um, uh, some experimental data from this new hyperspectral satellite from planet.com, this Tanager sensor, and hope that we can um, find a good way to import it and use it in the Ember box. And um, we will. Uh, the plan is also to enter to go more into the details of how we can um, uh, use um, now um, time series of hyperspectral data, and um, to use it also for our large areas, which requires to put it all to prepare the data into data cubes and yeah, make make use of it. Uh, that's it. Um, this is the Emberbox development team. Um, uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. And um, yeah, thanks for your attention. Really great presentation. I don't think it brings really the QGIS a little bit more sense into another level. Um, we already have the opinions uh, that you would be more sensing with hyperspectral uh, was, of course, uh, not yet covered. And it's Complicated, and I think you agree to provide nice uh, solutions for people working with that type of data. As well, they did some theory by uh, Masters, if I would have this, it would have been much easier for this. That thanks. <laughs> um, before I talk for some questions, I have the questions in the audience.
This is uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, I'm curious because I, I, I noticed in, in the outlook for the future of the planning that uh, it was intended to be used for creative visualization. Uh, is that uh, on the web, in web applications or 3D visualization on this native application? The visualization of, uh, you, you mean this slide? Uh, and, and, yes. And this here? Uh, it's intended to to have a QGIS, so um, um, so yeah. So probably the data must be must exist in on um, somewhere where QGIS can exit is very fast, depending on your setup. As the data might may be in the cloud or in a local storage, but um, um, yeah, we. Um, we usually start there where the QGIS API provides us the data. So uh, if there are fast ways to ensure that data loading can be done from, from cloud storages, then um, yeah, you can you might use it. But uh, so far we stay within the, the boundaries of the QGIS API. Right. More questions? One question, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I'd like to ask, is it a really big difference in working with the uh, business resolutions of the images? For example, if you say set like which is the multi one resolution and it's very very long images, the difficulty will be another, that which really affects NTI analysis the resolution of the um, can we use a spectral resolution now? Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 and but the, the NEDI in your case, or, um, or in, I mean, it, the spatial resolution um, has an effect, of course, um, because um, the higher the better, you would say, but um, unfortunately, with the finer, better spatial resolution, we are not able to get the same um, details in terms of spectral resolution. Um, um, so this, it's always a compromise in terms of sensor um, design. What do we like to optimize? Um, this, and and um, for a couple of applications, for example, uh, in geology or so, it's uh, really required that um, the, the spectral resolution is very fine, very narrow, in terms of what um, the wavelength that is covered by a single band. And uh, that also requires a good... Um, um, the signal to noise ratio, for example. And that's the reason why these hyperspectral satellites usually have a, now what is pretty coarse, um, spatial resolution of 30 by 30 meters. You probably can expect better resolution somewhere in the future, but um, and, and, um, yeah, that's the reason why we have a um, coarse uh, spatial resolution to favor the spectral uh, detail. Um, in terms of the spectral index that you calculate uh, for the NEVI, okay, now it really might really depend on which spectral index you take. Um, not each question can be solved by a hyperspectral instrument better than it is a, with a common multispectral instrument. And then for several applications, the higher spectral resolution is key, probably as well. Um, it's, um, so, but um, yeah, it really depends on what you, which, which question you like to answer. So, probably I did not answer your question, but uh, <laughs> gave more details. <laughs> it's, it's complicated. Time <laughs> for the last question. Okay, then I need one question. So, uh, you did about um, satellite-based hyperspectral, and of course, the biggest difference with uh, hyperspectral from airplanes that I've used in the past is the jetty of the atmosphere. Do you have any uh, tools there to do atmosphere correction from hyperspectral, or how, how do you deal with that? Yes, um, there is. Uh, I mean, the hope is that your data provider delivers you already corrected data. Um, but there is uh, also, um, I think there was a slide. Uh, um, one application, no. Well, here, this, um, the, the ENPT, ML Preprocessing Tools, 
developed by Daniel Scheffler, and this is, uh, allows you to to uh, to go into the details of atmospheric correction of AML data. Yeah? So yeah, it's it's included. At least the AML box has a graphical user interface for, but you can install it from from PIP um, as well uh, without having the AML box if you like to process and do the atmospheric corrections for for many multiple uh, MAP images. So, thanks for presenting. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't know what's in it. Blink. Ah.